You people, you people, gather around me. Come around, I want to tell you something. I have some news, I have something important to say. Everyone come around, come around. I want to speak to you all. Gather around. God has spoken to me and he's told me that every family on the 10th day of the month must take a lamb from their flock and keep it carefully until the 14th day. You're to gather a lamb. It has to be a male lamb, one year old. No good you bring one with a broken leg. No good you bring one with a doggy chewed his ear or the crow has pecked his eye. Has to be perfect lamb, one of your best ones. A male, one year old, one of your best lambs, a perfect lamb. Keep it and tend it and feed it until the 14th day. And then you will kill that lamb and collect its blood. And you take that blood and splash it with some hyssop leaves on the sides of the doorpost and across the doorway of your homes. That will be a sign to the angel of death that uh, blood, death has already occurred there. <coughs> and then you take that lamb and you prepare it for a meal. Cook all of it. Even the innards, all of it, the bones, the hooves, the intestines, everything, all has to be cooked together. And it has to be roasted. Don't eat it raw, don't boil it, roast it. Everyone understand me? You have to take a lamb, one year old, a perfect lamb, a male lamb, and roast it, all of it. And if there are not enough people in your family to eat the whole of that, then you go and invite your neighbours in. Bring the neighbours in. They can help you share. Bring them all to your home so that there are enough people for, to eat the whole of that lamb in one meal. Now make sure that everybody has some. Must be big enough lamb for everyone to share. Everyone must have some of that meat. And what's left over, don't keep it. In the morning, the bones and whatever is left have to be burnt and destroyed. So prepare the meal. Get the lamb ready and prepare it. Roast it with bitter herbs. Then make your bread without yeast so that it's just a flat, thin cake. And that will be your meal. <coughs> then get ready for your meal. <coughs> there are things that you must do. You must get your coat on. And... Get your belt and strap it round. Get your sandals on. Put your sandals on and strap them on. You're going on a journey. Get your sandals on. Get your coat on. Strap your belt around. Get your staff in your hand. And when you eat that meat, you don't sit down and relax. No, you eat it. You gobble it. You are in a hurry. Eat it quick. You must do these things. And uh, don't anyone go outside the house after the meal is finished. Because God said that the eldest, children, the oldest child in the Egyptian families will die during the night. But your children will be perfectly safe because of the blood that you have put upon the doorposts. That is the sign. And when the angel sees that, he will pass over you. It won't touch you. And so these people, you <laughs> think how funny it must have looked, crammed into the house with all the neighbours, dressed up, ready to go, with their food gobbling, and uh, it must have been so strange to see. But they were acting out a part. They were showing, you see, that they were prepared and believing that God was finally going to keep his ancient promise and they will be delivered. And uh, Moses gathered those people around and gave them all those strange instructions, each one very detailed, you'll notice. He gave instructions as to how the meat should be cooked. He gave instructions as to how the bread should be ba baked. He gave instructions as to how they should be dressed. He gave severe instructions they must not go out in the street. He made them realize that this was very, very serious. And uh, Moses preached and told them these things. And so that night, they huddled in those houses, waiting. The next morning, devastation. The oldest child in each of the Egyptian families were dead. 
and the Egyptians couldn't get them out of that place fast enough. Go! Go! Until then, they'd sort of changed their mind every time, but now, go. And finally, they were on their way to what we call the Promised Land. Now, that's uh, an old, old story that you find way back there in the Old Testament part of the Bible. But each part of that has some significance. One of the little things that I missed was that they were not to break the bones of the animal they were cooking. <laughs> what significance is that? Those of us who know the story of Jesus and the story of the crucifixion will be able to match up what happened there with what happened then. And we look back at those things and they were all a symbol of what would happen when Jesus came and died upon the cross. And I've just drawn that picture here uh, to show you that contrast between the two. There was blood upon the doorpost. And when God saw, when God saw the blood, the plague that came passed over. We know that story. And uh, the blood upon the doorpost was the sign that death did not enter there, the Passover. And this is a very important thing to the Jewish people today because they haven't recognized their Messiah. They still every year celebrate this feast. And the next part of the Bible that Moses gives them are all the directions and instructions as to how that feast should be held. I had a friend who was a Jewish boy when I was a student. And I used to go to his place uh, on holidays. It was down at a place called Goulburn. And he was on a property there. And I loved going down there because there were horses to ride. And uh, it was wonderful going down to his place. But one of the holidays that I had there happened to coincide with the Passover. And they said to me, "We please excuse us, but you cannot come to our meal tonight. We've prepared a meal for you in the kitchen. And so I, I ate my meal apart from the family that night because, you see, the instructions in the Bible was to say that no strangers were to take part in the Passover. And here today, in our day, in our generation, in our world, they still keep that law. And uh, I went and sat by myself in the kitchen, had my meal while they celebrated their Passover uh, together as a family. And uh, they still do that, even today. They celebrate that Passover feast and they follow the instructions that are given there. But of course, uh, we uh, know that there's a difference. Uh, Jesus is our Passover lamb. And uh, in the Bible, uh, we've got a reference there on the sheets that you'll get this morning, where Paul clearly links the two between the lamb that was killed and Jesus that suffered on the cross. Just that clear link between the ancient performance, that was the shadow. That was sort of a, a, a message to the people of what was going to happen down through history to this moment when the, the lamb would be slain. Now think about the story of the Passover. What was the, what was the message of the blood? Simply this. The blood upon the doorpost says, death has already been here. There's the blood to prove it. Death has already been here. Someone's already died in this house. You don't have to come here with death. Death has already been here. In the form of the substitute lamb. The lamb that had taken the place of the eldest child in that family. The lamb had died instead of the uh, child, the eldest child of that family. And there was the proof, there was the evidence, pass over here, death has already been here. But as we look at the cross and think about the cross, we can say, my death was accomplished there. I died there. I have already been punished for my sin. I have already been punished for my transgression. I have already been punished for the things I failed to do. Because my substitute has taken my place and died instead of me. That's the gospel. That's the truth of it. And that's the wonder of it. 
that I don't have to fear judgment. I don't have to fear God's displeasure because Jesus has taken my place. Jesus has died for me and the blood that he shed upon the cross means that death, my death has already been happened, already accomplished. And I can look at the cross and say, because he died, I'm dead. And because he lives, I will live. And the New Testament talks about how we identify ourselves with what Jesus, who Jesus is, what he did when he died, and what he did when he rose, so that we live a new life. We died with Christ, we're raised with him, and we have a new life in him.